All right. Hello, everyone. All right. Welcome Hello, to this everyone. week's live stream with Rum Cask. Uh, today, Indianon is here with Sergio Murath to talk about the history of rum and cocktails. I hear it goes pretty far back. Um, before I turn things over to those guys real quick, uh, I'm Will Hookinger from Savvy.co. Uh, if you've joined us before, you probably know your way around. If it's your first time, you'll see a chat to the right. Feel free to tell us hello, say where you're tuning in from. I see, uh, let's see, we've got John from Virginia, Leonidas from Brussels, Doug from Coventry, Gary from Bromley. There's people from all over. It's awesome to see everyone. Chet yep. says hello from a warm and soggy West London. Is that an ap accurate description today, guys? Yeah, that's I don't definitely. Know. It's, it's warm. <laughs> it's warm? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's so, been for also, all of two minutes today. Uh, that probably made things nice and nice and sticky. Um, so if you guys have a question at any point during the presentation, you'll see a little button at the bottom that says ask a question. Feel free to drop it in there. I'm going to be relaying those questions over to Indy and Sergio throughout the presentation. Uh, but with all that said, uh, Indy, I will turn things over to you now. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Will. Really appreciate your introduction. Um, hey, guys. Uh, welcome uh, again to one of our live streams. Really appreciate you joining us. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some of our previous live streams and um, got a really, really unique one for you today. So uh, the guest we have today is a London-based rum advocate. Um, he works as a brand ambassador for Jamaica's Worthy Park Estate. He also works in the legendary uh, rum bar in London, Trader Happiness. Um, he's done multiple tiki takeovers across the world and in general spreads the word of good rum and cocktails throughout the globe. Uh, really, really excited to be able to introduce Mr. Sergio Marath, uh, the dude in vibes. How are you, Sergio? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, mate. That was a, that was a fantastic introduction. And um, I feel like um, it, it may have given me a little more credit. Uh, but um, yeah, hopefully we can, we can turn this into uh, an enjoyable and maybe even an informative session um, on rum history and cocktail history because you know, rum is one of those spirits that has been put into mixed drinks pretty much since its conception. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of spirits you don't necessarily associate with mixed drinks as much. Um, but rum was mixed from very, very early times. And and you know, there are some iconic drinks. I'd say some of the world's most iconic drinks are made with rum, but perhaps a lot of people aren't aware of the vast amount of history in rum drinks that again just like rum production stretches across the globe although again just like rum production it is centered around the americas and especially the caribbean yes absolutely um so guys just to give you a quick kind of overview of what we're going to talk about today um we are going to focus on the history of, of um, rum in cocktails we're going to talk about um rum punches we're going to talk about how they're they came into concept. We're going to talk about uh, rum and uh, cocktails in Cuba, in Trinidad. We're going to talk about prohibition. We're going to talk a little bit about tiki, cocktail revival. There's loads of different topics. Um, so please, if you have any questions for us, or I say us, I mean for Sergio, um, please put them into the chat, um, and we're going to try and answer them as we get them, hopefully. Um, but Sergio, otherwise, yeah, happy to um, get going. Yeah, so so whenever discussing the history of, of, of rum cocktails, but really the history of cocktails in general and mixed drinks, the first thing I always go to uh, is punches. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, and punches come from the same sort of general area that sugarcane comes from. You know, when, while sugarcane may be the most associated, again, with the Americas, it actually comes from uh, the Hindustani Peninsula, uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, that sort of area. Um, yeah. And that is the area that gave birth to um, a drink we call Batavia Rack. Now, Batavia Rack is very closely related to rum. Really, the main difference is that in the fermentation of it, you use red rice as a secondary fermenter. Therefore, you can't really call it rum because it's not just sugar cane. Um, yeah. But it certainly has that big sort of funky flavor that you, that you associate with um, a lot of historically styled rums or, or, or something that you would associate with a big sort of post Jamaican or a pot distilled cane juice rum, you know, those big grassy, rich, funky flavors that I know that you love and that, and that I love. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so, so, and, and, and Batavia Rack is not 
necessarily the world's easiest thing to drink on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially for, uh, for a lot of European palates, um, it seemed uh, quite harsh. So um, during the, the colonization of this, uh, of this area, um, the English, particularly the officers who had enough money to get a hold of uh, extra ingredients, yeah. they started drinking it in punches. And now these punches would have traditionally consisted of uh, Batavia rack, um, citrus, particularly lemon, tea, and water, and a little bit of nutmeg. Okay. So, you know, that, that, was, that was the basic setup. Uh, later on, they started integrating brandy, and then they started integrating, uh, when, it, when it made, punch made its way back to Europe, they started integrating stuff like Madeira or port. You know, mm -hmm. again, this was very much a high society drink. You know, punch, punch wasn't something that the, that the normal people would be drinking, that the everyday people would be drinking. It was strictly for the higher classes and for the officers uh, stationed around that part of the world. Right. And that was true for the first uh, few decades of uh, the history of punch until it made its way to the Caribbean. Now, in the Caribbean, uh, people were drinking um, a few different things. Um, most of it was uh, was um, especially the indigenous population. They were uh, they were historically chewing on various barks and then sort of spitting it into that communal bowl until it fermented and yes, made a yes. and made a very early alcoholic beverage from that sort of a beer like uh, a beer like beverage. Mm -hmm. But that all changed in the 17th century, and we all know around 1650 in Barbados is when people really started fermenting and then distilling molasses into what we know as rum, although there are some earlier signs pointing to 16th century Brazil and the, uh, and the Dutch there uh, distilling cane juice or fermenting and distilling cane juice into rum. But really the most uh, common recognition is around the 1650s. Uh, okay. Chetty Singh is intrigued by Batavia Rack and wants to try more of it. Uh, <laughs> there's a brand called By the Dutch. And if I'm yep. not mistaken, actually owned by uh, Scheer. The, yeah. uh, the blend is from Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. um, that is important into the UK. It's delicious. The thing about Iraq is that it's also sort of a general name for a lot of spirits made uh, in Asia. So, for example, from Sri Lanka, you have um, Iraq that is made from the ferment of uh, coconut sap. So that's going to have a very, very different flavor profile. So you have the sale on Iraq that, that is also available in the UK. Again, very, very different. But uh, the By the Dutch Batavia Rack is, uh, is delicious and super funky. It's great for cocktails, great for punches. Um, mm -hmm. I'll put up a couple of recipes on my Instagram after this. Perfect. But yeah, so, so, so once it made it, once rum has started getting big, people also immediately started, um, started mixing it. Now, the Caribbean isn't necessarily that rich in lemons. Mm -hmm. What they do have a lot of is limes. And obviously, what was necessary for the creation of rum, well, well, what, what rum was a byproduct of, is sugar making. Um, so they had lots of lime, they had lots of sugar. Yep. Obviously, they immediately started mixing these things together. And, uh, and rum, lime, and sugar really became the backbone of mixed rum drinks. And, and you know, up to this day, I'd say 95% of all rum cocktails use that combination in um, in some manner. Um, but yeah, and, and it was in the Caribbean that punch started more gaining ground among um, sort of everyday people, more, um, more lower class people, not necessarily just the planters. Um, however, one interesting um, group that I need to that I need to touch on that has a lot of association with the uh, rum yep. is uh, pirates. Now, a lot of our pirate myths, a lot of connection to rum and pirates, actually comes from uh, Treasure Island, from Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, the book. Yeah, that's when that's when this this really is popular perception of of pirates drinking rum started. <laughs> Think about when you think about most historical pirates, people like Captain Kidd or Henry Morgan or Blackbeard. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't pirates in the sense that they were outside of the law. In fact, they were more, you know, independent contractors. They were what we call privateers, which yep. was yeah. essentially their own their own private military 
contracted to various countries, most of the time to the English. Um, therefore, logically, who they would have been uh, robbing at the time were sometimes the Dutch, sometimes the French, but primarily the Spanish. And right, the right. Spanish crown actually um, forbid the export of rum from its Caribbean colonies to the mainland because they were afraid of uh, rum displacing sherry and Madeira and port and Spanish brandy. All these drinks made in mainland Spain at the time. Mm -hmm. So rum wasn't anywhere on these Spanish ships. It wasn't anywhere on these Spanish towns, anything that the pirates attacked. They would have found port and sherry and Madeira. So, so you know, what actually pirates drank were really expensive desert wines. <laughs> it's not quite the same marketing association as it is as it is with rum. Uh, Captain Morgan should really start making Madeira uh, <laughs> instead of spice rum. Um, but yeah, so 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 pirates didn't really indulge in a lot of rum up until sort of the end of the pirate age, up until the end of the the end of the 17th century and the and the early 18th century. At the time, however. What they were usually taking is they were taking also these expensive ingredients that I mentioned before, lime and sugar and, and nutmeg and various other spices. So instead of just drinking rum on its own, they were actually making punch. And mm -hmm. punch became a very, very integral part of a lot of um, ceremonies, for lack of a better word. For example, you couldn't have an election for a captain without, without, a, large bowl of, uh, without a large bowl of punch. Uh, you couldn't hold pirate court where they were where they were making decisions over what to do with the prisoners they have taken, what to do with the um, with the various treasures that they have that they have taken. And you know, really, the basis for any legal conversation is definitely being really, really drunk on punch before that. You know, that's <laughs> that is, that is definitely, uh, wow. definitely the way to go ahead. Uh, <laughs> U.S. privateers going after British rum, but not pirates. Yes, Maggie. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, however, somewhere that punch has made a bigger effect than almost anywhere was the New England colonies, um, mm -hmm. to the point that a, a census from the 1740s uh, actually shows that colonial taverns had more punch bowls and punch cups than... Um, tables and chairs and benches and beer tankards combined. That's how much punch they were drinking. And I actually wow. have a recipe here. Let me quickly find it from a um, from an election. It's called the Meeting House Punch. It's from mm -hmm. 1789. And it was served in the town of Metfield, Massachusetts. It was, uh, it was to celebrate a political election. And this is what they used. Four barrels of beer. 25 gallons of West Indies rum, 30 gallons of New England rum, 34 pounds of sugar, 25 pounds of brown sugar, and 465 lemons. <laughs> this, okay. was punch, this was the punch that they had made for the entire town. <laughs> we should do that these days. Um, I Yeah, it would be pretty difficult. Question from Eric K. Is there any true Batavia Iraq currently being produced from the island of Java? I'm actually not sure. Um, I would imagine that there might be a, a few small local producers who may be making it, but I'm actually not sure if there's if there's any sort of genuine local Batavia Iraq. And I mean, I mean, very early on as well, a lot of it was taken over by the Dutch East India Company. You know, so the, the, uh, so Batavia was obviously the Dutch name for for Java. Um, as a Dutch colony, so so I think I think very early on from its popularity, it was something that was controlled by the European powers rather than necessarily a product that became huge locally or in the region. Yeah, he hasn't found one from yeah. Yeah, I think it would be quite tough to be able to actually find one, but I, you would expect with all the little distilleries popping up um, when you go to visit any country that there are probably local... Yeah, I, mean, I mean, up until four or five years ago, I was pretty convinced that Barbancourt was the only rum you really got in Haiti. 
and then you know and then all this wonderful clarence started popping up and and you've got all these you've got all these amazing tiny distilleries yeah. making absolutely incredible liquid so you know i wouldn't be surprised if that was but it just hasn't quite hit uh hasn't quite hit popular knowing knowledge yet two um so yeah so 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 punch was huge in new england and rum was huge in new england it was really the the fuel of the revolution you know in in many ways it is what led to the war of independence and what led to the the establishment of the us through the the molasses act and the sugar act mm -hmm. that was um levying heavier and heavier taxes on the on the people from the new england colonies uh making it more and more difficult uh to import molasses from the caribbean at a good price and then making smuggling more difficult after that because for a while after after the first act they 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 continued without any problems just illegally um yes. until the english crown has really started upping its um upping its patrols to to look for to look for um smugglers mm -hmm. but yeah it was um it was huge and um and it started gaining ground among the smaller caribbean islands as well and um one of the ones that um that i tend to bring up because it's connected to um, a rather interesting person is the is the father labat punch and now father labat these days we mostly know because there is a, a guadalupe rum named after him um he was nominally a a priest but i think if you're both famously a slaver and also had six wives on six different islands you're taking you're taking the letter of christianity in a slightly interesting personal interpretation yeah, um, yeah. however for all his horrible um qualities he was also a massive gourmet um if you actually read through his memoirs He's got these really, really elaborate recipes for uh, for all kinds of food. He was he was a massive what we would probably refer to as a foodie uh, today, but he also <laughs> left um, a punch recipe using um, specific. He specifically mentions rum from Barbados uh, and a little bit of sugar and a little bit of um, lemon and water infused with spices. So he he basically made the equivalent of like a syrup using um, cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg. Essentially a very early pimento dram, which is probably why it's why it's so close to my heart. Those of you who know me, <laughs> well, no, I, I, I have an overly large fondness for, uh, for pimento dram as an, um, as an ingredient. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, so it's it, it, it sort of continued unabated until the, until the mid 1800s. And then in America, which was really at the time the center of um, of mixed drink development, something called fancy punches appeared. Now, fancy punches were fancy because they used ice instead of water. And using, using ice also meant something else, uh, and that was that these drinks, instead of always being communally served, mm -hmm. they started they started making individual punches. So they would they would keep this template, and you know, and the and the punch rhyme sort of appeared very early on. You had it in English publications going as far as back as 1824, uh, and you know, I'm sure we all heard of it. Um, one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak, five of spice to make it nice. Uh, some people believe that it refers to actual measurements. Some people believe it just lists of the ingredients in a nice rhyming way. Uh, there's lots of different versions. Uh, I know Maggie has her preferred variation on it which which slightly mixes up um how many parts of uh, how many par parts of what you have mm -hmm. um yeah it, it, it certainly goes back at least as early as the 1820s but probably a lot longer okay but yeah, it would take this template that you were applying for uh for large communal drinks and turn it into individual ones so these they started serving these drinks and then when they started serving these drinks they also started stripping them down and that's how you got to drinks like sours and 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 fizzes, you know, which are essentially simplified punches in a yeah. way. Yeah. And that takes us back to rum, lime, and sugar. Mm -hmm. Rum, lime, and sugar is a combination that pops up again and again 
in rum producing countries, but in slightly different ways, adapting always to what the rum of that region is. So let's talk about three drinks. Let's talk about the daiquiri, the caipirinha, mm -hmm. and the tiponche. All of them are rum, lime, and sugar, yeah? Absolutely. But they are served very, very differently. We'll, we'll go into detail on the history of the daiquiri very, very shortly. But as we now think of a daiquiri, it's a shaken drink, usually with two parts rum, one part lime, one part sugar, or thereabouts. Yeah, roughly. You know, sometimes sometimes slightly different, but but pretty much along those lines. Um, then you have uh, the caipirinha, mm -hmm. just uh, slightly differently. You know, most of the time it's served with, um, with muddled lime veggies and with raw sugar. You know, you have you're really getting those lime oils in there as you're muddling the sugar into the into the lime peel. You're getting all those oils coming out. It's going to be a little more fragrant. It's going to be a little more, the texture is going to be slightly different, which is again why you serve it over crushed ice, because you have that texture from the from the raw sugar. And cachaça is very, very aromatic. You know, it's it's very big and oily and 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 quite punchy on the nose. Yes. You're serving it differently. Then you have the tea punch. Now everybody has their preferred tea punch recipe, but most of the time it's a huge slug of rum with a little sugar, but especially when you use cane syrup, you know, you use this really, really thick, really sweet syrupy cane sugar. You don't really need more than one spoon. Mm -hmm. And some people just cut in a little coin from a side of the lime, you know, like barely a squeeze of juice and again, yeah. some of the oils. And the, the reason for that is because um, especially unaged agricole style rums and agricole rums are again, so aromatic and, 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 and so grassy and fresh that, but at the same time, pretty delicate that you don't really want to overwhelm them by yeah. adding too much. But they're all they're all a, a play on the same theme of rum, lime, and sugar. Yeah. 